Hello, everyone, and welcome to phalloseminar.org, a project supported by the Society of Systematic Biologists. For this session, we are hearing from three courageous individuals who are working to incorporate structural information into molecular evolution studies. The first talk was from Jesse Bloom, in which he described his work on demutational scanning experiments to develop per site models of amino acid substitution for specific genes. Then we heard from Klaus Wilke, who described using structural information to estimate mutation rates. And today's talk is from Richard Goldstein. The next set of talks will concern modeling rate heterogeneity in phylogenetics. As I mentioned, today's speaker is Richard Goldstein. Dr. Goldstein's background is in biophysics. He's brought this perspective to evolutionary studies and has been one of the leading figures combining protein structure considerations with molecular evolution. More recently, he has done some very nice work considering epistasis. Richard was on the faculty of, from, uh, in Michigan for quite a while, then to Italy, and now he's a researcher at the National Institute for Medical Research in London. Actually, not any longer. Oh, no longer, at the UCL. I'm at UCL, yes, infection and immunity. <laughs> Sorry about that, thanks. <laughs> So go ahead, Richard, take it away. OK. So I'd like to talk about some recent work that we've done in developing mechanistic models of substitution rates. So the basic motivation, of course, is that there's all of this biochemical, biomedical, biophysical research, but a lot of it is sort of dangerous. You have to protect yourself, or it involves torturing small animals, or, or bad chemicals, or radioactive spiders. So the idea is that we would be looking for a way of getting other information about proteins, and the obvious place to look is the flood of sequence data, which means that we have to develop ways for interpreting the evolutionary record, the evolutionary record encoded by all of these sequences that are now available to us. So when we interpret an uh, evolutionary record or interpret almost any um, type of signal, what, we're in, what we need is a particular model that allows us to, um, to analyze that, that record. So for evolution, we have, of course, standard empirical models of sequence evolution. This is the techniques pioneered by um, Dayhoff, uh, Margaret Dayhoff, and there's the JTT model, the WAG model, et cetera. But in general, what you do is you take organisms, you extract the DNA, you do sequence alignments, and then you generate um, some combination of um, phylogenetic trees and or models of how amino acids change. Um, models that involve rates of change, rates of um, which some, one amino acid is substituted by another during the evolutionary process. Um, the models that are um, commonly used, um, the standard models commonly used, um, all is generally assume that there's the same relative rate for all sites in the protein, whether the location is inside, outside, dimerization site, active site, or whatever. That the rate is the same constantly throughout the evolutionary tree, and that every site um, evolves independently, that there's no interactions between the various sites of the model. So the way that I think of this is it's like a roulette wheel, that um, there's a certain probability of uh, substitution occurring, and that um, probability comes up in the same way that a bull falls into a, into a hole in a roulette wheel. And so you, what you're doing is you're modeling substitutions as just something that happens randomly at, at a given um, rate or a given probability. And just like in a large casino, you have a bunch of these wheels, one for every location in the protein. And what happens at one table doesn't affect what happens at another table. All of these changes are occurring stochastically with some probability as a fun, um, for, per unit time, um, independently of, of each particular, um, what the context that that uh, amino acid has in, in that particular protein. Well, we know these models are bad. We know these models are, um, do not explain the data very well, um, but there is still the, the, they are still the basis for um, interpreting the phylogenetic data. You know, so here, when I add positive selection, my model goes from horrific to terrible. You know, and that is, that's the type of judgments we're using in order to establish evidence of various signals or various properties or various processes in, in the evolutionary record. Um, and so by having um, uh, these rather um, uh, unrealistic models, what we're doing is risking model misspecification where we can make 
I end up making claims that are not justified by the record, but rather just exist because our models are just not good enough to tell otherwise. You know, so what we would like to do is we would like to develop better models of substitution, more realistic models of substitution, that substitutions that, that can better encompass the type of patterns that actually occur in, um, in um, evolution, molecular evolution, which means going beyond the spherical cow approximation, you know, going into um, a more realistic picture of the evolutionary process and how it occurs, um, going beyond seeing organisms as, as files on a database of proteins, as a string of letters, as an amino acid, as um, one letter or a, ba or a codon as, as three letters, to recognize that there's a lot of complexity going on here, a lot of context going to up upon here, and that this really needs to be incorporated if we want to have a... Um, a um, acceptable, start having an acceptable level of accuracy in our evolutionary models. So as I mentioned, the models that we're dealing with are primarily empirical models, that what we have is all this data, um, and we put, um, imagine that there's a black box which calculates, which you put in one sequence, and it calculates the probability of a substitution at any site in any, in any period of time. And what we're doing is we're just trying to describe the data that we observe and the way the data um, changes, the way the sequences change over, over evolutionary time. There's no attempt to try to um, model the evolutionary process in, in the rate matrix. It's just a black box that's supported by um, a statistical analysis of the data set based upon certain assumptions, which, as I mentioned, are, are of questionable validity. But the main thing we're trying to do with the empirical models is how to represent observed sequence changes in a mathematically tractable form. Um, there's problems with this method in the, in the future in terms of trying to incorporate some of the complexities we're interested in. You know, if we have a general time and site dependent substitution rates that vary in an um, unknown way over the tree and among locations, the amount, we will never have sufficient data to be able to set all the various parameters necessary for such an approach to work. In addition, the parameters that we get from these models represent um, effective um, inter uh, parameters that often do not have a clear biological significance. So the other alternative is to try to represent the biology in the model, to try to have a mechanistic model which encompasses what's happening at the DNA level, what's happening at the protein level, what's happening at the organismal level, and what's happening at the um, uh, ecological level. Um, so that would be something that would give us a lot of insight into what's happening in the biology. And if we could really understand how these things work, it could greatly constrain the types of, of models that we um, could, could develop, making it a much more tractable problem. Um, here, the question is, how do we represent the biology in a mathematically tractable form? But the question here is, do we understand molecular evolution sufficiently well to model it? You know, there's still some very basic debates about, um, about the nature of the evolutionary process, of um, the process of molecular evolution. And so it's not clear whether we have the knowledge necessary to try to implement these mechanistic models. The situation is even worse because we don't even know what the questions are that we need to, um, need to answer, that we don't have enough understanding of how to even think about the process of molecular evolution acting on proteins to understand, the, to get a framework for which to um, de decide what measurements we need, what measurements are possible, how to test various theories and, and develop um, different frameworks for, for conceptual frameworks for the molecular evolution. So we want um, mechanistic models, but our understanding of biology is a bit out of focus. So one of the themes of this talk is that if we put on um, the glasses of statistical mechanics, that that could give us a lot of power to bringing the biology back into focus. You know, that it gives us a set of tools, perspectives, and um, frameworks, conceptual frameworks necessary for thinking about the evolutionary process in a way that could then lead to um, uh, better questions, better experiments, better formulations, and ultimately better 
models of the evolutionary process. Well, one of the things of um, evolution that's, um, that occurs in all levels is what Charles Darwin um, called the tangled bank. He, what um, he meant, descri was describing was the fact that every organism lives in a context that is mostly formed by other organisms and the way they change the environment. Um, this, so that each organism is existing in, as part of a network of other organisms which determines their selection, determines um, what their fitness is, de um, determines the evolutionary dynamics uh, that they um, undergo. And so this occurs at the molecular system as well. Proteins are not string, um, a uh, um, bag of amino acids. They are rather an integrated system with a structure, with a function, with a physiological context. You know, the positions in the proteins are, get their um, uh, role by their interactions with other positions in the, in the protein. Um, and proteins are under selection to fold, to be stable, to function. All of these properties, folding, stability, and functionality, are um, properties of the entire sequence of the, um, of the protein. You know, they're a property, a holistic property of the entire protein. And therefore, a function of all of the interactions in the proteins um, the, um, that determine its foldability, its stability, and its function. So um, what we really want to do is to look at these um, context dependence, how proteins evolve as units, as, as pro things such as epistasis, the way various locations are dependent upon each other. But this involves having a better understanding of how the evolutionary process proceeds. And studying evolution is difficult. Um, there was, uh, here's this um, uh, real fourth grade exam from the US where this child was asked, asked the next time someone says the earth is billions or millions of years old, what can you say? The child says, were you there? And this is a real problem, actually, that we can't observe evolution in real time um, for, you know, general, unless you're dealing with HIV viruses or something that's, that's fast evolving. But for a lot of the systems that we're working on, that doesn't happen. And if you write a research grant um, for studying the real-time evolution of mollusks over the next million years, you're going to get it rejected. <laughs> okay, so the question is, how can we study the evolutionary process given that we weren't there in the past and that we don't have the time scale available to us to study the process in, in, in real time in, into the future? Um, so the alternative is doing computer simulations, computer models, and trying to use the computer models to um, to decipher the various patterns of um, that occur during molecular evolution, which can then be used to design ways of looking at the sequences and looking at the biology to verify the the um, principles that arise from these simulations, as well as to um, to give a framework, a conceptual framework for thinking about how molecular evolution occurs. So proteins must fold, be stable, and function. What we want to do is to have evolution occurring with these proteins in, in our context where we're looking at, specifically at selection for a trait that's, um, that's a holistic trait that depends upon the property of the entire protein. So we're going to study proteins um, evolving under the tendency to, to be stable. So we're going to start with a computer, and we're going to have a protein that um, we're going to be measuring the stability of it, and we're going to allow it evolve through time such that it maintains adequate stability. So we're going to start off with a DNA sequence. And we're going to represent that, um, translate that into an amino acid sequence, calculate the stability, which will give us a probability that the protein is folded at equilibrium, which will be defined as a fitness. Well, they'll then have a mutation occur at the DNA level, which may or may not cause a change in the amino acid level, which will result in a different stability, a different probability of folding, a different fitness. We will then use Kimura's formula for the probability of a fixation, probability of fixation of a mutation based upon the difference in fitness, roll a, a die, find out whether or not the um, mutation has fixed, 
and then repeat the cycle. So what we, that allows us to do is to observe evolution over um, long, long periods of evolutionary time. We estimate with um, typical uh, substitution rates, we're, at, um, we're having simulations of about 5 billion years. And every point in time, we know exactly what the sequence is. We know exactly what the instantaneous um, substitution rates are. We know exactly when every substitution occurs. Um, what that corresponds to in the base change, what that corresponds to the amino acid change, which allows us to have a very clear picture of the evolutionary process as it's occurring in the simulation. So we're interested in a number of questions. Can we characterize the nature and consequences of epistasis? Can we understand the basic principles of epistasis? Can we use this to develop a deeper understanding of the process of protein evolution? And ultimately, what we would like to be able to do is to predict substitution rates from first principles. So one way of looking at that is to look at equilibrium frequencies, um, how they depend upon location, how they depend upon time. Uh, as the equilibrium frequencies of the amino acids are a measure of what amino acids are allowed there, not allowed there, what are the propensities for the different amino acids, um, what is the affinity for the different amino acids. And so this, I'm looking at a, a traditional empirical model, the WAG model from Whelan and Goldman. Um, the other models give similar results, and we could see that the equilibrium frequencies are independent of time, and they're the same for every type of site, buried site, exposed sites, or whatever. So the empirical models involve equilibrium frequencies of the amino acids that are um, same for all sites over all time. Well, as I mentioned, with our uh, simulations, we could calculate the instantaneous um, substitution rates at each site at each instant in evolutionary time, and we get a very different pr um, picture. What we see is that, one, there's differences in, um, in um, the affinities for different amino acids measured by the equilibrium um, frequencies, and that these vary quite a bit, and that they're different for buried sites and exposed sites. The color coding is shown on the, on the right-hand side. So it's somewhat maybe clearer if we represent these as, as pie charts. And you can see, again, that there's quite variation amongst uh, the various pie charts showing the various affinities. Um, and so one observation that we get right away is that the evolutionary parameters, equilibrium frequencies, substitution rates vary greatly as the rest of the protein sequence changes. So, so Richard, could, could you just clarify, is this um, sort of, there's a single fitness that's, that's staying constant here, or are, are, you, are you changing sort of the fitness constraints as the simulation goes on? Um, so what I mentioned is the fitness is um, measured by the probability that the sequence would be uh, would correspond to a protein that would be folded at room temperature, um, and so this these proteins are evolving under mutation selection balance, where the um, so the um, uh, the stability the probability of folding is uh, um, roughly constant it varies it fluctuates a little bit but it's pretty constant with time um, and it represents the balance between selection encouraging higher stability and um, the tendency of more mutations to be destabilizing and when those two terms balance out that determines what the fitness is going to be Cool. So, so we're seeing something effectively at equilibrium. Oh, yes. Yes, at equilibrium. Uh, mutation balance um, equilibrium. Cool. Okay. Okay, so the equilibrium parameters are varying greatly as the rest of the protein changes. Um, so the only thing that's changing with time here is the fact that other locations are, being, are undergoing substitutions. So it is the... Um, substitutions that are happening in other locations that are resulting in these equilibrium frequencies to vary all over the place. Um, if you take uh, the average equilibrium frequency for this one particular site and average it over the entire length of the simulation, what you find is that the average equilibrium frequencies is rather, um, it's rather permissive. You know, that the um, average constraints are much more permissive than the instantaneous constraints. And that is because you are averaging over all sorts of different highly specific constraints. 
So if one time uh, hydrophobicity is conserved, another time charge is conserved, and another time aliphatic nature is preserved, what you do if you average over a long enough period of time is it looks like there's no selection acting on that region at all. And so um, this, and it's interesting to compare this average equilibrium frequencies that we get with our model with, for instance, the equilibrium frequencies of a standard empirical model like um, WAG, um, in that they also observe these rather permissive um, con selective constraints acting on, on all locations, the same way that we get when we average over the very specific constraints, but specific but time-dependent constraints that occur during the evolutionary process. One of the, um, at this site in this period of time, um, this is a branch length of about three, there were one, two, three different substitutions that occurred um, from a V to an A to an E to a K. And if you look at the pi plots, you could see that um, in the majority of cases, the amino acid found at that location is very much favored by that particular location. So um, we show, demonstrated that there's this tendency in, in the paper a few years ago for the sequence to change to make that the occupant of that site and similar amino acids um, favored at that site. You know, that we call this the evolutionary stoke shift, this tendency of the protein to adapt to the amino acids found in the various locations of the protein. We could also plot um, the, uh, the um, pairwise distribution of equilibrium frequencies. So these are just um, various points in the simulation at various locations where I'm plotting the equilibrium frequency of aspartic acid versus um, histidine. Um, as, and, um, and you can see that generally most places, the, um, and neither is, is particularly well suited. I've added some scatter around the points near zero just so that they're um, distinct around the, uh, around the axes. If we look at only sites that where there is an aspartic acid, we see that when the uh, site is contained, has an aspartic acid, the equilibrium frequencies for the aspartic acid tend to be much high, very high, and the equilibrium for um, histidine is, is quite low, and we get the opposite situation when the current amino acid is histidine. So again, this shows this Stokes shift, uh, um, this uh, evolutionary Stokes shift, um, that the amino acid uh, sequence of the protein adjusts to the current amino acid so that the current amino acid is, is favored. One of the interesting things is that we do observe substitutions between um, H and D. And these substitutions primarily occur on the line where both amino acids are equally, um, um, have equal affinity for that site, on, on those sites where the equilibrium frequencies of the two amino acids are more or less equal. We could plot the region in this um, the frequency plot, um, in this frequency diagram, where the substitutions would be almost neutral or nearly neutral or, or effectively neutral. And what we notice is that the substitutions occur under conditions of new neutrality. So that um, the vast majority of the substitutions occur when the rest of the sequence has reached the point where the pr uh, propensities for these two amino acids measured by equilibrium frequencies are equal. This, um, in Michigan, I was in a physical chemistry department, and one of the things that immediately comes to mind when you see a situation like this is um, the theory of chemical reaction rates. In particular, the, um, oh, I have a video that I have to show. So this is, um, shows uh, the dynamics, the evolutionary dynamics of the equilibrium frequency of aspartic acid and um, histidine as during a transition that occurs about in the middle of the simulation. So it's bouncing around where um, in the region of the, um, of the space where, um, where this equilibrium frequency for aspartic acid is high. And then at one point in time, it undergoes a D to H substitution. And now it's bouncing around in the region of the plot where um, histidine is, is, is um, preferred.
So, Richard, can you? Uh, I, I'm sorry. Can you just clarify a little bit of exactly how this is all working? So, when you say an equilibrium, I, I'm imagining we start a protein at a single place, and there's some sort of. Uh, are, are we looking at like a single lineage going down, or is there branching? I mean, how do we get? Yeah, this is just straightforward the single branch evolution of a protein. So we just say equilibrium frequency. Uh, that, so that that's what I'm. The, it's it's some expectation over something. But what what the, what is an expectation over? Okay. So what an equilibrium frequency? Um, so these are instantaneous marginal equilibrium frequencies. So what we would do is we would say, okay, imagine you take the protein and you fix all of the amino acids except for the one that you um, at the side you're interested in and you let it evolve over long periods of time, what would be the distribution of amino acids you would observe at that point? So what it is, it's marginal um, uh, equilibrium frequencies conditional on the rest of the protein. So that as the rest of the protein changes, the equilibrium frequencies at that cycle change. That's one of the advantages of the particular um, setup that we have that we could actually calculate these equilibrium frequencies because we can measure the effect of every amino acid substitution on the fitness of the protein. We could measure, we could calculate what the equilibrium frequency um, that would then correspond to. Um, and we could see how these things change as the rest of the protein sequence evolves. I see. Okay. So, Right, so at any given time, there is a well-defined state of the evolutionary system, but you can go back, effectively, and try out lots of different substitutions and see what the equilibrium frequency would be with the, you know, if those mutations were tried. No, actually, we don't even need to do that. We, um, what we do at every point in the simulation is we look at every possible mutation. We then um, we consider every possible mutation um, uh, and... We then look to see um, what would be the resulting protein, how fit the resulting protein would be. We then calculate um, these equilibrium frequencies directly from the stability calculations for a protein under every single mutation, every single possible mutation. OK, thanks for explaining that. Um, is, that is that clear now? That's perfectly clear now. OK. Thanks. That's so, I mean, just a, a slightly different equilibrium frequency than, like, yeah, I, I mean, it just took me a little, yeah, bit to get to the mental image of what you're simulating. Thanks. Okay, this is really good that you're asking, though, because uh, I'm so used to these simulations. And the fact that because these are simulations, we have access to everything that happens in the protein and everything that could happen in the protein. And so we're used to thinking about all these things as things that could be um, trivially calculated, while um, people who are not used to these simulations think of these things as things that could be never measured, you know, or, or that would be extremely difficult to measure with the resolution, time resolution, and um, uh, spatial resolution and um, accuracy that we could do these measurements uh, computationally. OK? Got it. OK. So this, so what we have is, um, just to, um, to get us back on track, we have this, the substitutions occur when fluctuations occurring due to the sequence changing at other locations take the amino acid propensities into the neutral zone, that is the zone where the equilibrium frequencies, the amino acid propensities for the two amino acids are um, effectively equal. And so the substitutions then take place under these neutral conditions. Well, as an, ex, uh, as an old physical chemist, this comes to mind of um, transition, what's called transition state theory in the theory of chemical reaction rates. So you have, for instance, a simple um, uh, reaction like H2 plus H goes to H plus H2. There's, you define some type of reaction coordinate which tells you how close you are from one state to the other state. Like, for instance, looking at the hydrogen-hydrogen um, distances. And then you have the energy of the system as a function of this reaction coordinate, depending upon which particular state you're in. And the, you have a difference in, in ground states. But you have what's called the transition state, which is the state defined as where the electronic energy of the reactants is equal to the electronic energy of the products. And that is where the transition actually occurs. 
you know, so you have uh, um, the state of the system, it's vibrating back and forth, going, undergoing all these different conformational changes. And it's when it reaches a transition state where it can make a constant energy um, jump from, from one uh, state to the other that the chemical reaction actually occurs. And so this is uh, a theory that came out in, I believe, the 30s um, and is the basis for how we think about how chemical reactions um, occur. And so the idea is that if the green state is the um, uh, reactants, it exists in some type of distribution over the reaction coordinate. And there's some probability that the state of the system is at the transition state. And it is the, those, trans, uh, those rare excursions to the transition state that determine the rate of the chemical reaction. That the rate of the chemical reaction is equal to the probability of being at the transition state times the rate that would occur were you to be at the transition state. So the pink term here is the, um, there's the reaction rate at the transition state. And the purple term is just the probability that, you, that the system would be able to be at the equilibrium state, uh, sorry, at the transition state given this particular distribution of states. Well, we can apply this to substitutions just by turning the curves upside down and, and mentioned talking about fitness rather than um, energy. We could have a reaction coordinate that represents the equilibrium frequencies. And again, there's this neutral zone um, that occurs when the, um, when the frequencies are more or less, more or less the same. Um, and again, just as transition state theory um, calculates the reaction rates as being the probability of being in the transition state times the rate at which the chemical reaction would take place if you were at the, um, at the transition state, we could calculate the rate for a substitution as the probability that you're in this neutral zone times the substitution rate that would occur under conditions of neutrality, which is just the neutral substitution rate generally equal to the, to the mutation rate. Um, and so this gives us a way of calculating substitution rates based upon um, first principles that all we need to do is, is know the neutral substitution rate, the mutation rate, and the probability that the state in, is in the, in the neutral zone. So if I have similar amino acids, uh, for instance, here's um, leucine and valine, um, you can see that the amount of time that, uh, that is, the system is in the neutral zone when it's either a leucine or a valine at that location is actually quite high. So we would expect the substitution rate to be very high between these very similar amino acids. Well, dissimilar amino acids, here's a um, leucine and an arginine, are extremely rarely in the neutral zone. And this would then be the, our interpretation of why um, amino acid uh, changes between dissimilar amino acids are, are rare. So we have the substitutions, um, we calculate the rate of substitutions as a probability that you're in the neutral zone times the uh, neutral substitution rate. And um, again, when you have within this particular model in this particular framework, you could see that if the, uh, if the amino acids are more similar, it means that there's um, that they're closer together in this in this space, which means that it's easier for them to obtain the neutral conditions, which means that the substitution rate would be faster. So what we did is um, with our model, we could count substitutions, so we know exactly what the substitution rates are for all of the possible single um, base change substitutions. And so we calculated the, um, uh, the uh, rates based upon the distribution of stability contributions, which um, the distribution of thermodynamics, which, you know, um, given that we have a thermodynamic model, we would expect that to fit well, and that does. But interestingly, if we use the transition state theory, um, where we use the probability of being in the transition, of being in the um, neutral zone times the neutral substitution rate, and only allow substitutions to occur under those conditions, 
we still get an extremely good fit um, of uh, substitution rates over three orders of magnitude, which suggests that for our model, at least, this transition state theory approach is actually a very accurate way of calculating substitution rates for first principles. So what we have is a very different view of the evolutionary process compared with standard models. So Wright came up with this notion of the fitness landscape, and here's a picture of a fitness landscape with peaks represented by the green um, spots and valleys represented by the blue spots and um, local maxima um, by the yellow spots. And the idea of, of the fitness landscape is that you're moving through the fitness landscape. You're going up, you're going down. Um, you're um, maybe going up a lot if you're adaptive. If you're under purifying selection, you go up a little, down a little, etc. But the landscape mean is fixed relative to um, time, and you're just moving around this fixed landscape. What we're suggesting is that it's more like moving on, uh, walking on a moving seascape that what you can do is if fitness is going up and um, lower fitness is going down, what you're generally doing is you're making substitutions that are neutral, meaning that you're moving horizontally in the space. You're moving along these waves in a way that you're moving along a line of um, constant height or contour of this seascape. And so you're confined to a very narrow region of the space, but the narrow region of the space keeps changing so that what used to be a neutral region, a non-neutral region before becomes a neutral region, which can then be explored. And again, you could keep traveling as the landscape changes. So you're always moving in a neutral path through a very restricted space, but because the restricted space keeps changing as the, um, the rest of the protein changes, as the seascape changes, then you end up with being able to transver traverse large regions of the space, even though the selective constraints at any one time are very strong. So the interpretation of this is that it's actually the fluctuations that allow the evolution to occur. That you are would be confined to a very small region of the space if it were not for the fluctuations, that the fluctuations are not just a complication, but they're actually an essential part of the evolutionary dynamics. Um, so, but um, the problem with this seascape analogy is that we have this notion that um, of the evolutionary stoke shift, which means that the sequence actually adapts to the amino acids at, at one side or the other which means that there's an impact of where you are walking on the seascape on the height of that seascape. It's almost as if you're walking on a seascape in such a way that the ski seascape tends to rise underneath your feet. So another, maybe a, um, another picture to think about this, the old view was you have a fitness landscape represented here by three stools of different heights for three amino acids and the protein of jumps from one amino acid to another, with some changes being deleterious um, and some changes being advantageous. And in general, you go up and down under purifying selection about, about equally likely. So the new view is that you have a system where, where, where uh, when you go into a state, the state adjusts and the protein adjusts to make your um, the um, fitness of the amino acid um, current at that state more more fit and other words like it like leucine and um, amino acids that are highly dissimilar like tryptophan lower in in affinity and so then it's this process of fluctuations that occur in that in general keep the valine higher than some play, thing like tryptophan but there is some chance of entering this neutral zone where the tryptophan is um, roughly the same affinity as the valine and the substitution can occur. And then the system um, readjusts to the tryptophan at that location, favoring the tryptophan and now disfavoring the valine and the leucine. So again, fluctuations are not a complication, they are how the evolution occurs. Okay, 
So I've mentioned this stoke shift. I've been talking about the stoke shift and this tendency of the rest of the protein to adjust to the amino acid found at that site. But we don't, I haven't yet discussed a theory for the stoke shift of where the stoke shift comes from, how we could understand why the protein would, would, would tend to adjust to that height. And we could actually do this again using the principles of statistical mechanics. So birds got to fly, fish got to swim, and the physicists need to divide systems up into the system, the focal system that you're interested in, and everything else which represents the bath. So well, that's what we're going to do here. We're going to focus our attention on a single side in the protein, which we'll call, call the system, and the rest of the protein is um, the bath. So if you think about the contributions to stability, I'm going to think about three major terms. One um, very destabilizing effect is the conformational entropy loss, that the protein goes from an ensemble of a large number of possible conformations to a very small ensemble representing the folded state, and that this entropy loss represents a gigantic um, decrease in, a uh, gigantic increase in, um, in the free energy, uh, which is extremely destabilizing. And that's countered by uh, the stability, stabilization due to interactions with the focal site, the um, system that we're talking about, that we're interested in, plus the stabilization due to interactions with the rest of the protein. So in general, as I mentioned, the conformational entropy loss is extremely large. The interactions in the rest of the protein um, are also quite large. And then we add on the site-specific interactions, which give us a stability of a typical protein, in this case, about 10 kcals per mole. Interestingly, if you look at of this, these various terms over evolutionary time, we see that the contributions of the bath um, representing the rest of the protein and the contributions of the site we're interested in change in values, but their sum is constant. Now, so there seems to be a trade-off between the contributions to stability of the protein and the contributions to stability of the particular amino acid in the particular site that we're looking at. So the total, to make the total protein stability remarkably constant at about 10, in this case, about nine and a half, 10 kcals per mole, where, as I mentioned before, this represents the tendency of the balancing of selection for greater stability combined with um, the fact that there are way more sequences that are less stable, causing, resulting in most mutations being destabilizing. So if, Se only sequences with the same stability are relevant to the, the system if all of the sequences that we find have roughly the same stability. That means that all relevant sequences have the same fitness, which means that there is no reason for selection to favor one sequence or the other. And all that matters is the number of relevant sequences that have a, a given property or, or condition. So the probability of some property is just proportional to the number of the relevant sequences with that property. Now that we've removed selection from the, pro uh, from the problem by confining our attention to the sequences that are all roughly within this narrow band of stability. So that means that if, there, if the local site makes a very small contribution, the rest of the protein must make a larger contribution and if the local config, um, conformation represents a very high contribution to stability, much less is required by the rest of the protein. So that means that if the number of sequences with a given site-specific contributions will approximate it by uh, um, Gaussian, where psi is the contribution to stability made by the local, um, by the amino acid interacting with um, other sites in the protein. Um, and the number of sequences where the rest of the protein can provide the rest of the required stability, we could model as an exponential. What we would expect is that the number of sequences of the rest of the protein that can provide um, a given amount of extra stability is a very steeply falling function of the stability that needs to be um, added 
you know, which means it's a very um, rapidly increasing function of the stability provided by the site that we're interested in. And the total number of possible sequences is the product of these two terms, which just represents a shifted Gaussian, where the shift is exactly what we've been talking about this, with the Stokes shift. That is how the protein sequence will adapt to the resident in order to maximize the number of possible sequences um, driven by the um, tendency of the protein to maximize the number of sequences that um, corresponding to the uh, contributions from the rest of the protein. And when we work this system out, and um, so this the Stokes shift is just equal to the product of the exponential of the relationship between the sequences and the rest of the protein, and the width of the distribution of um, site-specific contributions. And that gives us a pretty good measure of calculating the estimated Stokes shift. What this means is with the Stokes shift calculated in this manner, we could calculate the distribution of um, the, or the likelihood or the probability that the uh, system would be found in one of this, these neutral zones, which means that we could calculate the substitution rates from first principles. And it's not perfect, but given that the rates are varying over three orders of magnitude, um, the calculations that we can make of predicting the substitution rates are actually quite, quite reasonable, especially since the calculation is only based on the distribution of sequences with a given site-specific stability contribution, the distribution of sequences with a given overall stability, with absolutely no adjustable parameters in the model. So, so Richard, um, I followed uh, the argument about the Stoke shift, and that was really nice. Uh, can you describe a little bit more about how you decide how frequently uh, a site is in this neutral zone? Right. So what we do is um, first, uh, so let me go back some slides, um, because it, it's actually quite fun. Um, what we need is the number of sequences with sp site specific contributions that uh, where there I I which is not being affected by the presence of the amino acid where the amino acid is not present at that site um, so what we and that's just to get the average um, distribution of interactions that would that would occur if the protein were evolving without selection at that site. So what we do is we put in a non-interacting amino acid at that site, and we run simulations with that non-interacting amino acid, and ask the question, what would the, be the stability contribution at that site if that site were replaced with a given amino acid? That gives us the red curve. <coughs> what we then do is we look at the ratio of um, stabilizing to destabilizing substitutions, and we could relate that to the difference between how many sequences there are that are more stable versus how many sequences there are that are less stable, and that gives us the yellow curve. Okay, make sense? Yep. If we have the red curve and the yellow curve, then we could calculate the purple curve because um, the amount of this change of the Stokes shift is just an easy function of the um, of the yellow curve and the red curve. Yeah. So once we have the purple curve, the purple curve um, reflects the um, and what we could also do, um, which I haven't mentioned, is we could also compute a similar um, a shift for other amino acids besides the one we're interested in. So if we're looking in, for instance, an analanine at that site, we could see what would the Stokes shift be if an alanine would be at that site. And we could also ask the question, how would the energy distribution change for lysine given that an alanine is at that site? Yeah, totally. OK, I got it. Once we have these two distributions of what's the distribution of stability contributions um, if an, a given at an, a, for an alanine, given an alanine is at that site, and what's the distribution for a lysine given in alanines at that site? We could then ask the question, answer the question, 
what is the probability that you are in this neutral zone where the affinities are close enough to be equal. That then through transition state theory allows us to estimate directly the substitution rate from the probability that you're in that neutral zone times the neutral substitution rate. Yeah, perfect. Got it. OK, OK. Um, are you getting any questions? Do other people seem to know, understand what's going on? I, I think so. I mean, we've got a bit of a quiet audience today. but OK, OK. So rather than so, just to to give a, a bit more of a um, of a picture of this, current substitution models substitutions happen randomly; they just occur by by chance. Um, I think of this as I'm going to call it football. After being in the UK for a while, if you look at a football match, you know a lot of times someone kicks the ball, and most time it doesn't change the score, but sometimes it does change the score. So you could imagine the, the uh, manager of the team getting together with his team and saying, wow, we could, should kick the ball more because some fraction of the kicks are getting into the net. Um, that would be rather poor advice because it's not how you kick the ball. It's the context under which the ball is kicked. That scores need conf favorable configurations. And so it would be more reasonable to give advice. We need to set up more scoring opportunities you know, situations where a kick of the ball is more likely to change the score in the right direction. So the new model is um, not one that imagines that substitutions just happen randomly, but rather that the substitutions require the generation of near neutrality by changes in the rest of the protein. Um, and that it is the rate at which these opportunities for a substitution occur that determines how often the substitutions occur. Oh, OK. Now a little bit just a, a, um, just a historical note. Um, there's a parallel behind the role of variation before and after Darwin. So you know, for the Neoplatonists, um, the, you imagine that there was sort of an ideal form of, of human being, and that you have variation amount, amongst that ideal, but that's because you know, there's imperfections, and you wouldn't expect um, anybody to be able to reach the ideal um, representation of what a human being really should be like. And that was replaced by Darwin's view of variation as the motor of evolution, that you have variation in, in this case, moth coloring and differential fitness, and it's the variation which allows the, um, the um, evolution to occur. So what we're hoping for is a similar thing to happen in um, the role of fluctuations. You know, and thinking in terms of fluctuation of the amino acid propensities, you know, there are four stages of denial. Can we talk about something else or, or variation? What variation? Bargaining, if I include variation, will I get my paper into MBE? Acceptance, well, I guess I need to include variation. To an understanding that it's the variation that's actually the motor for evolutionary change. You know, that it, that it is the variation that allows these nearly neutral situations to result that um, make it possible for amino acid substitutions to occur. And so this work is um, a collaboration with my longstanding collaborator, collaborator David Pollack, in um, Colorado. It's funded by the MRC, the NIH, and the NSF. And thank you for your time and attention. Wow, that was um, that was a different. fantastic talk. What? Uh, oh, okay, thanks. It's a little bit different. Um, Probably. Oh, whoops! I killed the. Um... Okay, I guess it's gone. Um... Go ahead. Oh, okay, but you see me instead, I guess. Um, yeah. So yeah, it's a little bit different, but it goes to trying to undercover the basic mechanisms under which substitutions can occur, with the idea that we need to ha at least have some framework, some conceptual framework for thinking about substitutions and, and what a substitution means, how it comes about, and how it um, occurs if we want to build more realistic models of the substitution process. Yeah, absolutely. It, uh, it's sort of actually, so we had Jesse speak as first the first part of this talk, Jesse Bloom, and 
It, it seems like there's a bunch of connections with your work. I mean, first, uh, one of the things that he showed during his PhD was that flu needs these stabilizing mutations before it can uh, have a diversifying mutation to escape mm -hmm. some immune pressure. So, I mean, that seems to correspond pretty closely with your sort of view of the, like, it needs, it's it's sort of this, you had the red and the, the orange arrows, and somehow the, I think the red arrow needs to get small, uh, so well, that's just a scout shift. Um, so the, the red um, and yellow, orange arrows was mostly the description of the Stokes shift, that this, the larger the red arrow is, the smaller the orange arrow can be. The smaller the orange arrow is, the many, many more sequences that corresponds to. So then you would expect there to be a tendency for large red arrows and small orange ar smaller orange arrows. But it still seemed like this, that this, there was the same theme that it's sort of like if you, if you have a very stable protein, then, the, then you don't have to have a big contribution of stability for that particular amino acid site. We're saying the exact opposite. That, um, <laughs> no, no, um, it's, so the, the thing is, what, um, and, I'm, and it's opposite but not contradictory, if I could put it that way. Um, so our point is that you would get, because of ent sequence entropy, you would tend to get large red arrows and smaller orange arrows. You know, and that's exactly the Stokes shift, this tendency for the rest of the protein to adapt. So the red arrow, the length of the red arrow, is represents the contribution of stability to the, of the, that particular amino acid. If the amino acid is substituted out, you lose that stability. So what that red arrow size represents is the affinity of that side for the amino acid. So what we're saying is that there would be a, a tendency for the red arrow to get larger, which represents the tendency of the side to adjust so that that amino acid has a high propensity for that side. I should make that um, link a little bit clearer on the slides that large red arrow means high propensity because that's the penalty you would get were the, you, you to lose that amino acid at that site. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. But I mean, don't you, I mean, if you're getting into this neutral zone, uh, I, mean, in a, is it, I mean, couldn't you get into the neutral zone by just having the rest of the protein be exceedingly stable and that, perhaps that would then sh shrink the red arrow because that's the, the contribution. Um, so, and that's again um, why evolution tends to be actually slow. Um, you could do that, it's just you're working against entropy when you do that. You know, that you're, that it's, that all the, that you could do that but the probability of doing that is rather rare because the, that um, having the rest of the protein excessively stable is just a, a result, um, you're choosing very much fewer sequences that correspond to a very highly stable protein. So, you, so in general what happens is the other thing happens, that you end up having a minimal contribution of the rest of the protein and a maximal contribution of the amino acid found in that location, which means that it is um, uh, harder to make a substitution. So think of the women on the on that woman on the stools. When she jumps onto a stool, the stool rises, which means that she's surrounded by deleterious changes in all directions. And if it weren't for fluctu fluctuations, then um, it would be very hard for her to move off of the stool in any direction at all. And so it's the stools rising that tend to slow the evolutionary process down relative to um, uh, relative to what would occur without the Stokes shift. Yep. Okay. I, 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 I see the distinction now. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, I'm not. That's not to say that Je um, that um, Jesse's point is wrong. It's just that um, because there are some fluctuations. It's just that in general. You know, what we get is a stabilization occurring of the, um, of the current amino acid, resulting in a tendency for it. So let me put it differently. Jesse's point is that if you have excess stability, it's um, easier to have a substitution, which is equivalent to saying with less stability, you have, it make it harder to have a substitution. And what we're providing is a mechanism where the rest of the protein tends to have less stability. So consistent with Jesse, we observe a lower substitution rate. 
with our stati with our simulations, we could turn off the Stoke shift. And when we turn off the Stoke shift, the speed of um, evolution increases. And, but the point is that you don't have to have this excessive stability in order to have a, a, a one of these neutral states. That just comes from the fluctuation. It just comes from the fluctuations, around yeah. the fluctuations. And um, that is why the fluctuations are so central to this theory without the um, with the Stokes shift, but without the fluctuations, you would get glacial evolutionary change. Good. So, um, I mean, what what are the prospects for incorporating this sort of thing into a phylogenetic, you know, you know, actual models that one could use for reconstructing trees? I mean. Yeah, yeah. So there are two different issues involved. One is, can we develop better models? And the second is, can we use better models? Um, so in terms of the second one, um, my collaborator, David Pollack, has been um, has developed a method called PLAX, which um, involves augmented data um, uh, approaches to um, implementing very um, complicated models of the substitution process with um, that scales with complexity very well. So it'll be interesting to see if these methods can handle the t um, type of, um, of models that we would need to do a better job. But, but um, things look good in terms of new approaches for, um, for phylogenetic computations that use some of these newer concepts. Um, we have some ideas that we want to pursue about how these, um, these um, models would translate into the type of first type of quantities you need to uh, determine in order to figure out what the model should be, but also what the form of the model should take. One of the um, and um, so, in terms of rate um, heterogeneity, uh, there's um, there was the original covariant model of, of Fitch, um, which allowed you to change between various um, uh, various substitution rates, as as we observe. Um, then there were these models which about, where you could have a bunch of different substitution matrices and you could have some type of hidden state where you flip between one matrix and another. What I would say is that those models involve extrinsic fluctuations, that there's some rate at which you flip from one amino acid to another given that you're in a given model, or that you flip from one model to another given that you have a given amino acid. And so that's again your roulette wheel, you know that it, it's just whether the spin um, uh, comes up your way or not. What we're talking about is much more an intrinsic change, you know that what happens is the protein is adapting to things that are happening inside the protein itself. So, for instance, there's an amino acid that gets substituted into a site. And the changes that occur at the rate of that side is not due to some roll of the dice, but rather is um, due to some predictable, um, hopefully um, ultimately predictable, changes that occur as the protein adjusts to that new amino acid. So it's the idea of being able to model, to include the um, process of intrinsic rate change rather than extrinsic rate change that I think is going to be the, the direction we're going to want to be pursuing. But, I mean, the only way I can see of getting at that intrinsic information is by doing modeling, like you're describing. Do you think that we're going to be doing protein modeling as part of phylogenetic reconstruction? <laughs> um, I think that what we are looking to do is, um, so so far, the the success rates with doing real protein modeling has not been not been not been very good looking. Um, I think what that there is still potential of um, of once we build a framework for how this intrinsic um, uh, cha rate changes occur, then we can know what to look at in terms of the data to develop the sense of what patterns emerge in the data and try to build um, patterns over there. So what I would call is it's me mechanistically informed empirical models. Yeah, I mean, it's just interesting to just sort of speculate what sort of form those things could take. I mean, if it's not a covariant model or something like that, I mean, 
I mean, I mean, I can imagine there being something where you maybe do some sort of not very good ancestral reconstruction in the tree as far as what amino acids were there when, and then, but then that somehow uh, informs your substitution rates via some like Stoke shift type thing, but. Mm -hmm, but even at the point of having in the model that there's a, um, a consistent tendency towards the development of Stoke shift that occurs on, um, so we looked at the time dynamics of this, and it's the worst possible condition. It's, you know, if it were fast, you would just say, we don't care, we average out over it. If it's slow, you say, well, we'll take the constant rate. If it's medium, things get complicated. We found it um, could be fit by a stretched exponential. Um, decay of the autocorrelation function, indicating that we're getting the relaxation occurring on old time scales, basically. <laughs> so, you know, there's some things that happen under very short time scales, others that happen over um, geological time scales. You know, so, um, uh, so it's a complicated thing, but there's still a, with the awareness that that's going on, we could try to look at um, systems that are densely sampled and try to see if we could actually estimate the magnitudes and the nature of this type of effect, and then try to use that to develop further models that represent the evolutionary process a bit better. Yeah, I mean, if you do just sort of, I, don't, I mean, I, yeah. Yeah, it would be interesting just to think, like, what is the, like, really simplest, stupidest thing you could do, uh, even, yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I well, mean, it, I guess, like, it seems like actually even a first order thing would be that everything is under um, purifying selection to, um, yeah, because of the Stoke shift. I mean, if you just put in some type of um, stretched exponential um, the decreasing rate, for instance, based for, since the last shift, and you put in the relative. Um, similarities and differences between amino acids, even something like that would provide some type of, um, of um, in improvement with the very simple changes of the model. You know, it, it's, what you need to do is you need to have some bit of history in there. Yeah. And it's including the history. And you're right, you could do it through ancestral reconstruction, but I don't know if you would need to do that. Um, I think you could just e uh, do something easier in terms of just measuring relaxation rates. Yeah. You know, so again, I think of the field of chemical reaction dynamics. You know, once you have a theory, then um, uh, you have ideas of what to look for, and you have a way of fitting it together in your theory. And so you could come up with other simple models, but the simple models now are in a different language and in a different conceptual place because of the model, the theory that you have, and even places where the theory breaks down, for instance, um, are now things that you could talk about and study and evaluate and know where to look you know, um, uh, once, you have the, once you have the model. You need a train schedule to know how late the trains are running. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, do you ever get, I don't know, reviewers or just doubters saying, well, this is all very nice and it's definitely progress, but, um, you know, here you have a single amino, like a single protein uh, sort of in isolation that um, is at mutation selection balance, that there's, uh, you know, the, the real tangled bank is a lot more tangled than that. <laughs> I absolutely agree. Um, um, but um, I think that this notion of epistasis, the role of epistasis, the effect of epistasis is something that is um, being generally accepted by the community, you know, and, um, and, the, um, and so I think that in general, I, we found the community to be very receptive to, to these ideas. Um, um, it's obvious that the standard models are inadequate. You know, what you could do is you could ask a question, what log likelihoods would you expect to um, achieve were the models to be accurate representations of the evolutionary process? 
and you get things that are way down, you know, kilometers away from you. Um, and and so there's a notion that that these things are are of course important, and that um, that we need to move away from from the purely empirical models. Um, and there's a nice community of of people working on these type of problems and these type of issues. Uh, so it's 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 actually a um, very nice time to be working in this field right now when we're undergoing a, a, a shift in. And how we think about um, sites. You mentioned that the next session is on rate heterogeneity. You know, which and again, when you think of rate heterogeneity, either you have a model which is unjustified and overly simplistic, or you have a model with um, a abnormally large number of of, um, of adjustable parameters, which is. Um, we've been doing a lot with the Halper and Bruno style uh, mutation selection models, you know, where there are 20 um, uh, adjustable parameters per site, you know, and um, and allowing these things to change. Um, so it's obvious that you need some type of goal, um, some type of um, cardinal points to try to direct your analysis. And so I, I have the feeling that there are people who, that generally the community is just eager for these types of things. The other thing is we've shown that it matters. Uh, so for instance, um, we did analysis of um, probability of convergent evolution, um, homoplasy, you know, all these things central to the phylogenetic um, program. And we find that, um, that simple models massively underestimate um, the convergent evolution rates. And uh, this is something that can confound phylogenetic trees. So it's a matter of real relevance to people doing phylogenetic analyses. You know, phylogenetic analyses are now mainstream. Um, you know, the number of virologists um, who, who are involved, that's, I mean, infection immunity um, surrounded by virologists who are absolutely embracing phylogenetic techniques and um, approaches. Um, and they need good ways of getting accurate answers, you know, and if the good, the accurate answers means dealing with these things like epistasis, you know, that's, there's going to be support for people working on that. Yeah. So any PhD students or postdocs who are looking for good problems, I uh, highly recommend this. Yeah. Uh, I mean, yeah, obviously there's lots to do. <laughs> well, um, thanks for entertaining all of my questions. Um, I, I'll, I look forward to doing some more reading. Um, and thanks for anchoring uh, what was a really great session of three talks. Okay, great. Thanks very much. All right. See ya. Bye.